Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for hanging around for a bit longer to watch this. Uh, apologies for the notes. Uh, I made the mistake of going on holiday, uh, and I got back and found I was nominated to do this. So um, I haven't quite learned it off by heart yet, but I know the context. So good afternoon, and thank you for coming to listen to my presentation. My name's Harry, and I'll be exploring the topic of additional income from Regento farming and how the initiative we run, Regen Agri, can help farms unlock that. I don't need to explain to today's audience that agriculture is at a crossroads in the UK and globally. Farmers face a multitude of issues related to climate, environment, market volatility, recent trade deals, and sometimes barefaced criticism. However, there is no hiding from the figures. There are issues, especially related to emissions and soil health. In the UK, forestry and agriculture are responsible for 12% of the nation's emissions. Unlike other industries like fossil fuels, agriculture has a unique opportunity to be part of that solution. In Britain, that changed. Oh, too many. That was a spoiler. In Britain, we have the ability to greatly improve natural capital stock and lock away carbon. Elm seems to be a step in the right direction, rewarding public good. Government has said that it will cost around 1.5 billion every year to action the proposed measures needed to reach emission reduction targets. But at the same time, these would generate 4 billion annually in benefits, which is quite appealing when you consider current cap stands about 3.5 billion. This would require over a fifth of farmland to go into carbon-based projects. Uh, the Committee on Climate Change also want to add 30,000 hectares of new broadleaf and conifer woodland annually by 2050. They also recommend a 20% 20, 20 shift away from beef, lamb and dairy to, a to alternative protein. And they want to grow an extra 23,000 hectares annually of bioenergy crops. So, things look to be sorted. There's a target, 2050. There's a date. Uh, so there's a target, net zero, there's a date, 2050, or if you're from the NFU, 2040, and there's methods for achieving it. There's planting trees, converting land, reducing livestock. Right slide now. But I think this slide demonstrates a slight elephant in the room. In 2017-18, the average level of debt and liabilities across all UK farm types was 230,000. A staggering 15% of farms had debts over 400,000. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, the highest debtors were in the special, specialist pig and poultry sector. But what is quite worrying, and, and given our context of where we are today, is that grazing livestock and mixed farms were still averaging around the £100,000 mark of debt and liabilities. I think we, you see what I'm trying to say without labouring the point any further. Farming has become increasingly difficult in terms of getting the balance sheet in the black. Farms have several options now. They can ride out BPS drawdown, apply for uh, mid-tier schemes and HLS schemes. Uh, they can plug the gaps till a Elm starts to kick in. Or, if you're of a certain age, perhaps you want to get out of the game altogether. However, for farmers that want to search them out, there is a plethora of new op options available for farms. Farmers are entering a very unique time. With Regenta farming, you can now see new rev revenue streams that monetize natural capital and ecosystem services. This, in essence, is what I'm going to talk about today. How can regenerative farming be rewarded through the release of additional income streams? It keeps changing on its own. This graph is taken from some research I conducted into the drivers and barriers to regenerative agriculture in the UK. It was with a series of uh, industry actors and stakeholders from a, a wide range of backgrounds. For me, it demonstrates several things, but from what you can see here is that the main barriers to adoption to regenerative agriculture were economic and farm characteristics, so that's the systems that are in place. But they also saw one of the main drivers to this change to regenerative agriculture also coming from, uh, from economics and from a change in farm systems. So for me, this paints quite a simple narrative that to change to truly environmentally minded farming, current farming systems have to change with financial investment or incentive. 
not to tarnish all farmers with the same brush and say that they're all in it for the money, but fundamentally, a farm is a business. And if the figures don't add up at the end of the year P&L, then the future of that farm is already carved into stone. Systemic change cannot happen without economic input. As I mentioned, uh, here in the UK, we're in a prime position to start tapping into new financial markets outside of subsidies. The Attenborough effect or the Greta effect, whichever term you wish to choose, has been felt. No longer is the status quo going to be adequate for the renewed interest in climate and food production. I will demonstrate how the initiative we have created allows farms to be rewarded for environmentally minded farming. So, Region Agri was born out of 100 years of uh, experience in supply chain inspections and sustainability consultancy. Region Agri is a regenerative agriculture initiative which is aimed at helping farms transition to regenerative systems. It does this through three unique pillars. One is the governance group, this is a group of organizations, many of them you would have heard of, the likes of the Soil Association and FWAG are, are part of our governance group. Uh, and they help guide the initiative uh, and make sure that we're measuring the right components. And then there's the digital hub where farms can take assessments, they can track progress, they can, they can access data insights. And we've just had a collaboration with the Cool Farm tool. I know there's a few different carbon calculators out there, uh, and now you can have your greenhouse gas emissions on there as well. Then the third part, which is the supporting services. So this can be verification and certifications of the farm practices, which I'll go to into a bit more detail. The assessment measures and monitors many of the regenerative methods that are widely talked about. I'm not going to explain to you how to build soil structure through no-till or the effect of native trees on agroforestry systems, as there are many more speakers here more qualified for that. I will explore how these different practices can yield additional income, what that might look like, and how that can be enhanced. Just for clarity's sake, when I'm referring to ecosystem services and natural capital, I'm, talking, I'm taking ecosystem services to be the various benefits which humans and nature are provided by healthy ecosystems. So carbon sequestration, water purification, flood prevention, just to name a few. These ecosystems, oops, sorry, need, repl need replenishment. And this stock is the natural capital from which these services derive. As we're all too aware of, we're currently drawing more out of these natural capital stocks than we are replacing which of course is madness when you consider we are reliant on them for food and fiber production and for the clean air we breathe. I will now look at some of the more established regenerative methods farmers use, which can deliver valuable ecosystem services in terms of financially and naturally. Then I will demonstrate how to monetize those. I will go through just three practices to outline the types of returns you could see for enacting them on your farm. The figures and data that's worth putting out that's used on these slides are taken from reports and uh, papers that are all relevant to a UK context. It's also worth pointing out that these practices work better when implemented in unison and not enacted as individual measures. Cover cropping can reduce soil erosion by 96% under established covers. Water infiltration can be between 1.1 and 2.7% times higher. Macrofauna can increase by 93% and carbon can be sequestered at a range of 0.1 to 1 tonne of carbon a hectare. If carbon prices rise as predicted, then a farmer using cover crops could see 30 to 50 pounds hectare a hectare extra on top of revenue for a given field. The additional ecosystem services for preventing soil erosion also means that there is the potential to attract organisations who want to enter into payment for water service schemes. Agroforestry, a complex system, as it may appear to be a complex system, are, is packed full of additional income opportunities. Imp implementation costs may sit at around £100 per hectare, but if a project is sequestering uh, between 0.5 to 4 tonnes of hectare of carbon per hectare at a selling price of £30 tons, uh, £30 a tonne, you can see that these projects can quickly wash their face 
and this is just looking at the payments from carbon. We're not even talking about the additional income from fruit trees or tree crops or timber, uh, and also the savings you can gain from inputs. Tillage practices are often looked at in terms of additional carbon storage and benefits for soil ecosystem under reduced or no-till farming. But for me, this table demonstrates perhaps another powerful figure, the emissions from higher disturbance tillage practices. Demonstrating the negatives of practice can sometimes be as useful as demonstrating the positives of others. The advantage of converting to reduce, the other advantage of, of converting to reduced tillage is the reduction in fuel. This presents another opportunity for acquiring credits. If the baseline data is there and you can demonstrate diesel reductions, uh, you can actually have those emission factors verified uh, as emissions that you would have, would have otherwise put into the atmosphere, and they can also be monetized. This table shows the potential sequestration rates from regenerative agriculture, but also the additional ecosystem services, which can be enhanced and have have additional value which can be extrapolated. Nutrient cycling, water retention, and erosion prevention could all form key characteristics of some of the PEZ schemes and bond structures which we'll now explore. So, the practices are enacted, the farm is flourishing, and the wildlife is returning in droves. What are the steps to monetize this? We suggest that our members take an initial baseline, or you know, outside of, of Region Agri, I'd really suggest taking these initial baselines. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. This not only gives the overview of where the farm is in relation to our criteria, but it also uh, allows you to see easily through our scorecard here, which is all color-coded, where improvements need to be made, and you can enter into continuous improvement. The emission data that's also captured um, through this assessment is fed back to the farms, and this works in unison with the scorecard. So you'd be able to quickly see if you were scoring high in your in your fertilizer application on their scoring, your emissions data will also be high. So you can quite quickly understand if you change your management practices around your fertilizer uses, you're going to see beneficial uh, beneficial outcomes for your emissions data as well. Many of you here today would have applied for or are indeed part of farming certification standards, so apologies if this is teaching you to suck eggs a little bit. The Regen Agri process is not too dissimilar. A farm registers an order to visitors, and there's a, a certification given at the end. But there's a slight difference in, in what we do, is that there is no pass-fail, there's no non-conformities. There's just a minimum threshold to achieve certified status. But if you don't achieve it, that's fine. It just follows on to the subsequent audits in a continuous improvement uh, process, which we provide in an audit report to help you manage the farm to get the score up. The farm will have to demonstrate and improve the score over subsequent audits against a matrix. This ensures there's actual re regeneration happening on the farm. The auditor uses the same assessment that the members can access. The results and data insights will be available through the digital hub. The verification process. This is slightly different step to certification. It took me a, a good year of being at this company to understand that there was a difference between verification and certification, but there is. The verification relates to the emissions data which is collected. So an on-site audit may have to take place, but if there is credible and supporting evidence, then this may not be uh, necessary. If when a farm applies for verification they have sufficient historic data, up to two years previous, with supporting evidence, then the current year's data can be verified under an ISO standard. We use 14064-5, which is a really great name and sticks in the mind. But if the majority of cases, the farm will need to, will need to submit what's called a project design document. This outlines, in basic terms, your plan to reduce your emissions or, or, or sequester carbon. This is then verified by a third, third party. And Really, the farm then enacts that PDD plan over the coming year, and through the hub, you monitor your emissions, and at the end of the year, that result is then again verified. And hopefully, what happens then is a verification statement is issued, and on that statement, there is a negative value, and that hopefully will amount to tons of carbon, because the current selling price for carbon is one ton to be able to trade it. It's worth pointing out here before we start to delve into the different options available to farms for additional income 
Not all avenues require there to be certification or verification of data. For some schemes, it's part of the journey to releasing funds. It seems that one cannot open any trade press or be sent any articles that don't contain some reference to carbon credits. In recent months, there's been some landmark cases of purchase of carbon credits for offsetting from agriculture, which is certainly helping to pave the way for future schemes, regardless of your views on Bill Gates, positive or not. The verification under the ISO 14064-5 will, will give the farmer a verification statement with the value of tons of carbon sequestered and reduced. This unique reference on the statement will allow the trade and sale of carbon credits on various markets outside of region agri. The carbon trading market is currently split across the compliance market and the voluntary market. The voluntary market is where we see most farms being able to access buyers and act as sellers. If predictions are correct, the voluntary market should rise quite considerably in the next few years, making it a far more attractive marketplace. As you can see here, currently the pricing isn't particularly attractive, but luckily at the top of the chart in terms of pricing is forestry and that land use is actually agriculture as well. So people are really interested in buying credits from, from land use, especially forestry and agriculture, and if there's the additional uh, evidence that that's actually helping other types of natural capital and ecosystem services, one hopes that these credits will also be worth more. So transitioning to regenerative farming. A lot of people talk about you know, transitioning to regenerative farming, bring down your uh, inputs, it's, you know, it's cost saving, but actually the fact is it can be an expensive system change. Here in the UK, a large part of the agricultural industry is made up of a very specialization, <laughs> specialized operations. To unpick these specific operations can not only be time consuming, but can also be costly. There are land agreements, machinery hire purchase, purchasing of livestock and infrastructure changes that all need to be taken into consideration. It's worth bearing in mind that many of these changes need to happen while the farm keeps its head above water and can only occur at the end of one seasonal cycle and before another one starts. We are currently working on several pilot schemes where we are looking to incorporate ecosystem services and natural capital into a model for loans and farm financing. In this model, the farm that is looking to transition is working with a green lender who fronts the capital needed for the farm to be able to make the changes towards, to move towards environmentally minded farming. The agreement can work in several ways. There can be a multiple of lenders involved to spread the risk, or just one lender. Then, when the farm has got itself in a position to start creating monetizable assets through ecosystem services, the loan giver can either be given those credits in order to, tra to trade them to regain uh, the initial loan, or the farm can enter an agreement where they can sell the credits and there's an understanding that a percentage from that sale goes back to repaying the loan, or the loan is only enacted because there is a third party assurance that the practices that are happening on the farm will indeed release additional income. And that's where we come in with the third party uh, certification and verification, which can, through the, through the verification and statement, can release those carbon credits which can be traded. Insetting is another area that is starting to become increasingly talked about by agri-food systems. Insetting can be set apart from offsetting as the source of the emission reduction comes from within the supply chain of the company claiming, rather than being brought in from an external entity. The structure is fairly simple. Companies either work with farms who are farming regeneratively, or they ask their suppliers to incorporate regenerative farming. In some of the pilot schemes we've been working with, they've also promised to pay the difference in any potential yield losses. And I'd say that's quite an important aspect to consider if you do work with any large agri-food companies and they're trying to ask you to transition your farm is that there's an understanding in the first couple of years is that if there is a yield loss, that will be covered as well. The farms are then monitored, certified and verified through Regen Agri and the credits are brought by the company from the farms in order for them to use in their own reduction targets and claims. These reduction goals may also be communicated to the end consumer. 
which can achieve a higher price point for the final product or attract new customers who are becoming more and more interested in searching out new produce that is grown, grown and produced in an environmentally friendly manner. There are some people, and I understand this, who are slightly dubious of large companies purchasing credits from farms for their own gain. But if those companies are paying a fair price for the carbon and the company is trying to decarbonize as well as offset, then we think these schemes could be very lucrative and help farms transition. So I imagine a lot of people here have already heard of PEZ schemes or, or payment for ecosystem services or environmental services or indeed are already part of them. But in its most rudimentary form, they can work as follows. A utility company spends thousands, thousands annually on cleaning water, removing nitrates, soil sediments, and other potentially hazard, hazardous particles for their end consumer. Instead of spending vast amounts of money on cleaning water, they decide to go to the root of the problem. And they'll work with a group of farmers in their catchment area that have land that feeds directly into the waterways. They devise management strategies to minimise runoff and leaching. This could be planting trees, land conversion and buffer strips, just to name a few. All of these which are measurable through Region Agri. The utility company then pays the farmers to deliver these results. The water company saves thousands on cleaning, the farmers paid additional income and also benefits from increased natural capital stocks. And the end consumer is delivered clean drinking water. Region Agri can be the vehicle for monitoring these practices, and if the scheme is designed in such a way, we can offer certification or verification, which is extremely useful if any of you have ever got a report back to a board or shareholders on performance. Finally, we have environmental impact bonds, or what are called EIBs. Given the new interest from, finan from the financial sector into agriculture, bonds give a direct line into the heart of sustainable investing and new environmental markets. This is even more exciting given that the green bond market grew, over, grew to over 250 billion in 2019. EIBs do differ slightly from green bonds as they are tied directly to the environmental success of a project. The funds are only released when the demonstrative difference to the environment is achieved. Thus meaning these are fantastic ESG investment opportunities with real credibility. They work not too dissimilarly to PEZ schemes. There is a group of investors which pay into a bond uh, who also work on an agreement with a group of beneficiaries, say uh, a utilities company or a local council. The issuer then releases funds from the bond which then finances the transition a farm needs to make in order to deliver the necessary ecosystem services that the beneficiary requires. The beneficiary then pays back into the bond which allows the investors to realize the return on their investment. No funds will be released through if there is no third party assurance that the practices and ecosystem services that are required are indeed happening. This is again where we come in and act as insurance for the bond, certifying and verifying the results. It also gives the farm a unique way to track their progress and use it as evidence in, in other schemes. These new markets and schemes are all still in their early stage of development. And there is some need and as a need for aspects of them to be made more relevant to a UK context and for some to be consolid consolidated. I don't realize that's such a hard word. Never before, perhaps never again, will agriculture have the ability to offer an answer to so many problems facing the world, not only in regards to feeding an ever-growing population by delivering food that is highly nutritious and produced in an environmentally minded way, but farms can also can also receive additional income for providing, excuse the phrase, public goods. Thank you for listening to our, well, my presentation today. We're at uh, stand MS5. If you have any more questions, we'd like to see a demonstration of the platform. I'd also like to thank the Groundswell team uh, for organizing such a fantastic event. Uh, uh, any more information is available there, or I am available for questions for sort of two minutes. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs>
That's an interesting you questioned, you know, if it's if it's based on practices and results, do you need to monitor the practices and that sort of yes. Yeah, I think you know that's an important part and you know natural capital, true natural capital and biodiversity is extremely hard to monitor uh, remotely. Uh, you know, for example, in what we're doing, we can we can infer from the questions we ask about management practices uh, what the effects might be on that biodiversity. Uh, but that's why we have the certification because that means that someone is actually going onto the farm to to measure or, or to check things are happening as they they said they they have been. But it, yeah, I think that's where the verification differs because the verification is so related to emissions that you're right in that sense the verification is very carbon focused but what we're trying to do with having a certification as well is also give a reward to farms who are practicing in that way which can be used uh, in claims or on packaging to hopefully uh, reward in a higher price point or give consumers assurance that the food they're buying is is nutritionally dense and produced in a way that is helping the local environment or the catchment area that they live in I hope that answers your question. At the back, yeah. Just quick one, how many farms are certified through Regen Agri so far? Uh, a, a, a handful, but uh, we're, on, we're on the way up. You know what's funny actually is we've had a, a much uh, more interest internationally than we have in the UK. Uh, and I think a lot of that is to do with what we're talking about today and at this event is, you know, we just had a trade deal with Australia thrown in the mix. There's, uh, there's, the, there's the leave of the Common Agricultural Policy. There's a slightly clear, unclear version of ELMS SFI. Uh, you know, there's Brexit. People don't want to invest heavily into change right now here unless they know that that's going to be getting them the subsidies that they need to um, carry on in this way. But what I, what I would say is that, you know, the farms that we have spoken to, the first bit of advice we give them is, you know, run the numbers. Look at what the numbers will look like under uh, a regenerative system. You know, do it on paper first. See where you can adapt things that are already happening on the farm instead of investing. You'd be amazed how you can convert bits or change housing or, or do whatever you need without actually having to put money into the project. Uh, and do it outside of subsidies. See what that looks like outside of subsidies as well. At the back there, yeah. I feel like a school teacher. <laughs> Sit down. When you say you the figures, is that including an estimate for what the they might, or what, what investment they might secure, or what payments they might secure? Yeah, I mean you can do you can do that. You can do um, you can you know we've done a few modellings for a few clients where um, we we put together a management strategy for them to convert the farms they worked with to regenerative systems and an estimate of how much that will cost. But we will show a negation of that through carbon credits at the pr tracking the price that carbon credits are going up as well. You know, but I think it's also important to do it without that as well, so you can really understand uh, where where you're standing. Excellent. Well, thank you very much.